dinner But I came hearted to receive from my Lord This was freely given And I found that He always keeps His word There's a new day written down in glory And it's mine, oh yes it's mine And the white and you sing the story A sinner has come home There's a new day written down in glory And it's mine, oh yes it's mine With my sins forgiven I am bound for heaven never more to wrong I was humbly kneeling at the cross here but not in God's angry frown Then the heavens opened And I saw that my name was written down There's a new name written down in glory And it's mine, oh yes it's mine And the white robe angels sing the story A sinner has come home There's a new name Written down in glory, and it's mine, oh yes, it's mine. With my sins forgiven, I am bound for heaven, never more to wrong. Look here, in the book it's written, saved by grace, yeah. Oh, the joy that came to my soul, now I am forgiven, and I know that the blood have made me whole there's a new name written down in glory and it's mine oh yes it's mine and the white robe angels sing the story a sinner has come home there's a new name written down in glory and it's mine oh yes it's mine with my sins forgiven, I am bound for heaven, never more to wrong. Amen. This is an exciting song. Did you know we have two baptisms today? Little Annabelle is supposed to be baptized. And Miss Reese, are you excited, Reese? Are you going to be going to hold your breath for 10 minutes? Uh, that's exciting. We got uh, birthdays and, and baptisms. And I heard uh, another birthday, too. Uh, Chris is 16 today. Is it today? Woo, man. How, should we sing happy birthday to Chris and everybody? And Norma's 16 too. And Leslie's 16. They're all 16 today. You ready for the happy birthday, everybody? Let's sing happy birthday. Happy birthday. I believe you got a haircut for your birthday. Is that right? That was fantastic. The reason why I noticed last week he had a really cool wave. You know when he waved it? But I thought it was cool. You didn't like it? It was kind of cool. Not many, not many people can do, pull that off, a little wave. Right? When you get my age, you, you wish you had a wave. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, let's pray and let's ask God to bless service. Glad, glad you're here for Sunday school. Uh, I know that encourages the teachers. So, And it is a little chilly in here, isn't it? We'll, we'll just... Uh, yeah, well, uh, hey, there, it's on a, it's it's on the the. Uh, uh, we I hadn't changed them. I don't touch them anymore. I touch my office. That's it. But uh, let's pray right now, right? Father, thank you for our, our Sunday school hour. Thank you, Lord, for these birthday uh, uh, folks here this morning. Thank you, Lord, for uh, just a joy to be in your house. Lord, thank you for our visitors, and Lord, we ask you to, you to speak to all of us into our hearts. God, uh, you know our hearts can get so hardened sometimes, and uh, so complacent, and I pray that, that you would just uh, warm us up. I know it's cold uh, physically in here, but Lord, we, we, we need you uh, to warm us up uh, spiritually as well. Uh, God, speak to us, I ask you. Lord, show mercy to us. Uh, help us to have a, a great day. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. All right. The, the printer's down, I can I assume. And uh, so we're doing digital, digit, di we're saving trees. 
digital bulletin this morning. So up on your uh, up on the screen, he of course we have the uh, pre-service prayer. We do want all the hey boys and girls as well. Uh, the girls that go in the room, the, the boys that go in the room to pray pre-service prayer. Prayer always uh, fixes things, uh, so we we'll encourage you to do that. And then of course our uh, online. Uh, uh, let folks know about that. There are probably some folks out there we have within our church that don't come yet. Let them know about, uh, they are loaded on um, uh, YouTube after church or at, sometime during the week. Uh, you can listen to Rushing Wind Radio as well. Uh, it goes live in just a little bit. Uh, no junior church today. Uh, he's staying in the sanctuary. Okay. And, and then we have uh, September 14th. You got, you got a week or so off for, for your knitting classes, but then they resume on the 14th for Miss Sharman. Um, FBI class, that's all online now, right? All online. So that's actually a better thing. Some of you, some of you may say, man, I'd, I'd take FBI, but I just can't get there once a week, three hours a week. And I understand it is a, it, it can be uh, um, uh, aggravating, but uh, this is all online. So I, do you have to take it at a certain hour? No, anytime you can view the classes. Oh, my word. Come on, guys. Take the class. How you do it? See, see Matt. If you don't see Matt today, I'll I'll see him for you and rank strangle his neck. Uh, you ready? You do it. Do it online, and it's the best thing you ever do. Um, let's see. Women's Bible study September first. Miss uh, uh, Susan handles that. That's this. Uh, believe it or not, can you believe August is gone? Uh, men's prayer breakfast uh, Saturday week, uh, the twelfth. Uh, meeting at the church. So men, you show up for that if you can. And uh, is that about it? Um, I do want to, uh, if you notice, the, the entryway is, is everything's done except the metal on the roof. We didn't have the, the metal on the roof, so that is done over there thanks to Craftsman for Christ and some other folks. Junior was over there helping and, and uh, some of the other fellows. Uh, thank you for all those that showed up yesterday. Let me, let me remind you, uh, well, uh, well, let me say thank you for letting us be away uh, for our anniversary. We had a, a good time just getting away. Um, and but but on the fifth Saturdays we we want everybody not just people that clean the church and yard show, but everybody that can show up that fifth every fifth Saturday, the whole church wide try to come and help and clean and literally if every if all of us were able to show up for an hour, it'd get done, you know. So try try to do that if everybody can that fifth Saturday, that would uh, be helpful. I know some people are not able to. Uh, we do need to pray for John Scott, too. John's got that uh, uh, blood spot in his eye. I hadn't talked to him in a couple of days, but we need to lift him up in prayer. Uh, and little Emma, need a lot, a lot of needs in the church. Uh, uh, as, you, as you hit the mountaintop, the valley always is after the mountaintop. And so when you have a good day, whether it's in church or not, you, you have to prepare yourself. That is the ups and downs of life. That's why Psalms, I think, 121, it says, I look into the hills from whence cometh my help. And I've said this to you. I believe that why, it doesn't make any sense that God, God's a God of hills. Well, what does that mean? Well, God's a God of the universe. But he's talking about the ups and downs of life. He's the same God in the, in the, on the mountaintops as he is in the valley and so, yeah. vice versa. So uh, be aware. Pray for these folks. Reach out to them if you would. All right, we're, in, we're finishing up. Is this finishing this up today? Second uh, Thessalonians chapter three, uh, verses thirteen through eighteen. Or next week we finish. I think. Uh, all right, but ye brethren, be not weary. in... W how about that? We we did it again, right there. Again. We did it again. You, you, uh, I'll elaborate a little bit. Uh, find your ministry. Find your. You find what you need to do that you're actively doing for the Lord because you will kneel before the Lord. We often say stand, but you will kneel. I will kneel before the Lord and give an account for what I, we tried to do. Now, understand there's one, God understands our, our weaknesses. He understands our inabilities. That's no excuse. You ask God, God, what can I do considering my knees hurt, my back hurts, my head hurts, my, my pinky toe hurts, and, you, and God will show you what that is. Nothing is insignificant uh, in, in doing it, you do it as long as you do it for the Lord. Amen? All right, so be not weary in well-doing. All right. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. Let, let me let me elaborate on this because I was thinking of this verse the other day. Because a lot of people think, well, with lost people, 
uh, you know, you're, you were supposed to jump through hoops and, and, and jump, do this and do that and all this kind of stuff. Uh, well, this is talking about, uh, back up, well, it says admonish him as a brother. It says that many, any man obey not the word of this epistle. It says have no company with him. Some of our problems in church is that we coddle sinners. I mean, Christians that are in open sin, we coddle them. So they say here, it says have no company with them. They need to be shunned to a degree. Now, go to the next verse. So the next verse says, uh, but yet count them not as an enemy. So you don't shun them and be like, I ain't ever going to talk to you again. No, you say, listen, I, I'm, not, I'm not hanging out with you. You're in sin, man. Like you're, imagine what things have changed that way. But admonish him as a brother. Talking about a brother in Christ, sister in Christ. All right, next one. Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means. The Lord be with you all. The salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is the token in every epistle, so I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And amen. That's uh, that's it. All right. Uh, I don't. I think uh, we'll dismiss for Sunday school. We might be just a hair early. You can fellowship just a little bit. We're two minutes and counting. All right. We're dismissed. John. Yes. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Sunday School. As you heard um, Pastor mention, there is um, the printer's down. So good news for those of you that don't like to fill in the notes. They're all filled in already. So you're getting them handed to you. I printed a few out at home. So I know Miss Janice was uh, going to go around and hand some of those out. But they're pre-filled in. They're highlighted. So the answers are right there. Um, and we'll get started in just a moment as I get myself organized. Just bear with me. Actually, we had a request before we get started to uh, just take a couple of prayer requests and the, um, and the person that, that opens our Sunday School in Prayer just uh, take note of some of these prayer requests. Hmm. And your brother-in-law's names, Smith Stella, Robert. Amen. Amen. So let's let's remember Larry. Confirmation of salvation for Larry, 87 years old, and Miss Stella's brother-in-law, Robert, as well. Brother Junior, would you open us up in prayer? Father, we uh, thank you again that you give us another day of worship. Now, Miss Stella was talking about the request of prayer, and her brother and his brother-in-law, and Lord, I, I do pray, Lord, that uh, the family, I pray that God would be your touch of the heart for each and every one. Uh, Lord, I know that... Uh, one for salvation, the 
Lord, what have you done to me to deliver us up to you, Lord? And, and we repent for the sins, Lord. I know you'll save us, Lord. We just pray, Lord, that this, this touch your heart, this is the one. So I pray again, Lord, be with Sam. I believe, Brother John, that you bring us a message today in our, in our church service today, Lord. We pray that everything is done in this glorified name and honor you. Amen. Thank you, Brother Junior. We're going to uh, continue our lesson on the strategies of Satan. And um, if you have it, just take a quick look at, at that part of the handout. We'll just do a very, very quick review. Thank you for putting that up on the screen for us, for those that don't have it handy. The first week of the study, we looked at uh, Satan as the deceiver, and we have on the left-hand side of the handout, or up on the screen, you'll see, we look at the person, the target, the weapon that Satan uses, the purpose, and the defense, our defense. So in the first week, the deceiver, the person he was deceiving was Eve, Adam as well, but Eve. Um, the target was the mind. The weapon was Satan's lies. His purpose was to make us ignorant of God's will. And our defense is the inspired word of God, the Bible, Scripture. Uh, the second week was seeing Satan as the destroyer. The person was Job, went after his body, suffering through his body, body. The purpose, Satan's purpose there was to make Job and make us impatient with God's will. And our defense there is imp the imparted grace of God, focusing on God's grace. Last week we looked at Satan as the ruler of this world. Our person that we focused on was David. Satan's target is our will, David's will. His weapon is pride. His purpose was to make us independent of God's will. And our defense is the indwelling spirit of God. Once we're saved, we have the Holy Spirit living within us. We have the indwelling spirit of God. This week, we're looking at Satan the accuser. And we'll be focusing on Joshua. Satan's target, you'll see, is the heart and conscience. His weapon is accusations. His purpose is the indictment by God's will. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. Our defense, you'll see, is the interceding Son of God, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We're going to turn to Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10. And again, some of you may have the handout. Um, I think Ms. Janice handed out a number of these. You could follow along in that or follow along turning, your, uh, turning through Scripture, through your Bible. But we're in Revelation chapter 10, excuse me, 12 and verse 10. The Bible says, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. We've studied so far the strategies of Satan. We just went through that as the deceiver, the destroyer, and the ruler. Today's outline, as we said, is based on uh, Joshua. And the focus there Satan's target, again, is your heart and conscience. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and we're going to look at verse 10 and 11. As I've said at the beginning of this series of lessons, we're going to do a lot of Bible reading, a lot of Scripture verses to tie into the, uh, to the um, lesson. So 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, I'll read, just follow along. 
To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ, lest Satan should get an advantage of us if we are not ignorant of his devices. It's very interesting how sometimes as Christians, we can be ignorant of Satan's devices. I'll say this, I was speaking about a week ago with Brother Gary on the phone while he's recuperating, and he said something very profound to me as we were chatting. He said, Brother, he said, you know, it's amazing that the majority of what we know, what the world knows, and what, more importantly, Christians know, the majority of people that call themselves Christians know about the devil comes from what Hollywood has taught us, not from what Scripture teaches us about the devil or about Satan, Lucifer. And I thought about that for a while, and he he had I said, I'm actually going to quote you on that. Allow me to just mention that we had that discussion, and he said, that's fine. Um, But it, it got me to think that how much of what I thought I knew about Satan about the deceiver, the accuser, the ruler, the destroyer, was based on my predisposition from television shows that I watched as I was younger, or movies that I watched about this, you know, horrible, you know, deformed uh, demons and that type of thing. Well, quite frankly, (laughs) the Bible teaches us that Satan comes as an angel of light at times. And, um, you know, that really had me thinking there for a moment. I'll say this, that suppose the believer sins, and we're going to get into this. The Old Testament example, as I said, was Joshua. And now we're going to talk about suppose the believer sins. We are victorious in Jesus Christ. Amen. But what if we do not take advantage of our position in him? Suppose the believer refuses to use the spiritual defenses provided when we sin. What do we do? Ironically, Satan leads us into sin. He'll lead us there. But he does not leave us there to suffer the consequences. He doesn't just lead us into sin and then say, all right, Satan says, I I got him or her to sin. Now my job's done here, and he leaves. No, that's not what happens. Satan is out to use one more attack so that we will be doubly defeated. Defeated by sin and rejected by God. This is where we're going to get into talking a little bit about Joshua the high priest. There's quite a few verses here, again, but let's turn to Zechariah chapter 3. And I'm going to read along verses 1 through 7. Zechariah 3, verse 1 through 7. And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with change of raiment. And I said, Let them set a a fair miter upon his head. So they set a fair miter upon his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord stood by. And the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, If thou wilt walk in my ways, and if thou wilt keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house, and shalt also keep my courts, and I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by." Let's remember that there was a Joshua who was instrumental in the first settling of Israel into Canaan. This is another Joshua who was instrumental in the Jews' second settling into Canaan after they returned from being in captivity. 
Satan's target here is your heart and your conscience. The courtroom of heaven. Picture it in your mind's eye. God's the judge. Joshua, the high priest, is the defendant. And Satan is the prosecutor, seeking to prove Joshua is guilty. Satan actually seems to have a case here. The high priest was to always wear clean clothes, but note he has on filthy garments. Good representation of the state of Israel at the time. Zechariah had this vision at a time when the nation of Israel had sinned against the Lord. The people had returned to Palestine after the Babylonian captivity. There was hope that the nation would return to God, to love God and serve God. Sadly, the Jews had not learned their lesson. In reading the book of Ezra, Nehemiah, Zechariah, Haggai, and Malachi, we see that there were several, several sin problems still. Jewish men were divorcing their wives and marrying heathen women. Jewish merchants were charging their brethren exorbitant interest rates. The priests, the priests were robbing God and keeping the best of the sacrifices for themselves. This explains why Joshua's garments were dirty, why they were filthy. He represented the people before God, and the people were living in sin. Satan knew that they were sinful, and he protested to God that Israel should be judged. He's the accuser. You can imagine the argument Satan used to condemn the people. It might sound something like this. This is not scriptural, but it may sound something like this. Satan, have you considered your servants in Israel that they are a rebellious and disobedient people? You've chastened them in Babylon, hoping to teach them obedience. Now they are disobeying you, disobeying you again. You are a holy God, God, aren't you? And Israel is supposed to be a holy people, <laughs> aren't they? If you are truly holy, then you must judge Israel. They are guilty. They are sinners. If you don't judge them, condemn them, then you are not true to your own nature or your own law. Israel is guilty. Now condemn them. Can you see him as a prosecuting attorney and, jo and God as the judge and Joshua sitting there just listening to the prosecution? I certainly can see it, having experience in being in court <laughs> hundreds of times in my law enforcement uh, lifetime. I, I've seen this play out in actual courtrooms, but we're talking about the courtroom of heaven. We're talking about the courtroom of Almighty God and Satan standing before him to accuse the brethren, to accuse me. Look what John's done. Didn't you see the path? He, he's a Christian. He's teaching in Sunday school. But look what he's done today. I'm accusing him. Do something. Do something. He's accusing all of us, the unsaved and the saved. He has power over the unsaved, but he's accusing us as well, the accused. Put yourself in Joshua's place just for a minute. How do you think Joshua felt during all of this trial? Like I said, sitting there as the defendant, listening to the accusations. His heart had to be broken. His conscience, his conscience had to hurt from the guilt. What defense did Joshua have? When you sin against God, Satan moves in for that finishing stroke by attacking our hearts and our consciences. Okay? He'll say things to you, just think about it, when, when we've sinned. He'll say to us, so you're a Christian? He may even have people verbally say that to us. Oh, look what... What are you doing? Oh, you're a Christian, aren't you? Well, they like to remind us of that. But at the same time, Satan is accusing us, getting into our conscience. You are not a very good Christian, are you? You go to church, you read your Bible, you pray, and you even seek to serve the Lord. And look at what you have done. Just look at your filthy clothes. 
If your friends knew, if your friends only knew you, the kind of person you are outside of those church doors, who you really are, they would throw you out. That's Satan speaking to us at times through our conscience. Before we sin, Satan is tempting us. We talked about this a moment ago. He's tempting us. He would say things like, oh, don't worry. No one's going to find out. You can get away with this. It's okay. Just this one time. He's tempting us. After we sin, the same tempter comes back accusing us. How about that? Wouldn't you like that? Two little kids, brother and sister. I knew we had this in, in the family all the time, having four children. I could tell you what. Um, maybe my oldest boy, John, talking to his next younger, next younger brother, Christopher. He's about two years younger. So I could just picture John, you know, 10 years old and Chris seven going on eight and John telling him, come on, let's, let's go. They're sleeping. We can go downstairs and play and do this and that. Come on. <laughs> next thing you know, mom wakes up, turns the light on. Uh-oh, we're caught. And John's saying, Look at what Chris is doing. I just came down. <laughs> you know, so there's an example of, you know, that's a lighthearted example, but nevertheless, um, that's the way we see Satan tempting us, and then as soon as we go down the path with, that Satan wants us to go down, you know, unfortunately, he's going to be the same prosecutor in your case before God, okay? Have you ever heard this hateful voice in your heart and conscience? If you have, then you know what it feels like to want to quit, to want to run, to want to hide, sometimes not even to go to church because I feel so guilty. I'm outside of the will of God. Well, how do you get back into the will of God? You seek God. It's okay. You can come back. We're going to get to that in a little bit as well. Satan's weapon, Satan's weapon is accusation. He's accusing us. He has the crafty deceit, the crafty deceit. We know that Satan is the father of lies. We talked about that already. When Satan talks to you about God, he lies just like he lied to Eve about God. Lies are another one of his weapons. We, like we said, we've already covered that. Here's, a, here's the point. Sometimes when Satan talks to God about you, he tells the truth. When it's to his advantage, he will tell the truth. An accuser does not necessarily mean that he is lying. An accuser can be telling the truth and still be the accuser of the brethren. We looked at Revelation 12, and verse 10, but I'm, I'm just going to read through it again. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the, the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Satan isn't sleeping. Satan is busy accusing the brethren both day and night. Every Christian who has sought to live for God, has heard this voice that your conscience, you've heard this voice in your heart. Think about it. See what Abraham just did? Satan was accusing Abraham. He lied about Sarah being his sister and not his wife. He lied. He lied. Did you see what David did? He committed adultery with his neighbor's wife. I thought that was one of your commandments. Thou shalt not lie. Hey, he not only was immoral, but then he was responsible for killing her husband. He's a murderer. Where's your justice? Judge him now. I know you heard, God, what Peter just said. He cursed. I mean, he used profane words, swear words. More than that, Peter 
just denied your son three times. You know it, God. You're not going to let him get away with that, are you, God? You see? He's accusing the brethren. Sometimes we know that voice as well. And like I said a moment ago, sometimes we can let that voice, that accusing voice, crush us. Hold us back. Hold us back from fellowship with other Christians because I just don't feel right. I feel like I'm lying. I Hold us back from attending church services. Hold us back from having conversations with the pastor when he reaches out to us, whether it's a telephone call or text or whatever. We hear that voice, the accuser, and it works on our conscience. I will tell you, though, that our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, died on the cross for those sins as well. And if you bring it to the Lord, take it to God, get right with God first, then get right if you have an issue with whomever you have ought with, whether it's your husband, your wife, your friend, a Christian brother or sister, whatever it is, pastor's been preaching on this lately. Get it right. Come back into fellowship, not only with the brethren, but into fellowship with God. There's the created guilt as well that we have to talk about. We must learn to distinguish between the accusations of Satan and the speaking of the Spirit of God. Remember that. We have the Holy Spirit living within us, we're being guided by that still small voice of the Holy Spirit as well. A feeling of guilt and shame when we sin is a good thing if it comes from the Holy Spirit. The voice of the accuser will lead to regret, to remorse, and defeat. The voice of the Holy Spirit will lead to reconciliation with God. There's the difference. Remember, the Spirit uses the Word of God in love. Satan uses your own sins in hateful ways. He looks to destroy your testimony. The Spirit seeks to bring you back into fellowship with the Father. Satan seeks to make you feel helpless and hopeless and apart from God. And he wants you to keep you there, basically. He wants to keep you separated from God because then we've been, we could be, pardon me, getting a little tongue-tied today, we become ineffectual for God, for Christ. Judas listened to a voice and went out and hanged himself, didn't he? Peter looked at the face of Jesus and wept bitterly, and later he came back to fellowship, the fellowship he so, high, he so highly valued. Beware of listening to the voice of the devil. Do not open yourself up to despair even when the accusations are true. Remember, the devil does use truth at times to convict you. Never think, never think, my situation is hopeless. I've done this great sin. I mean, let's look. We talked about Abraham, David. There's plenty of examples that, uh, that God has given us in the Bible. Um, don't go down that path and think, I've gone too far. I can't go back, even as a Christian. That, that's just not true if you have the Holy Spirit residing within your heart. That's one of the devil's lies, to keep you separated from a holy God. There's a lot of scripture we're going to go through, and that's one of the reasons that I gave you the handout just a few minutes ago. Miss Janice passed out the handout. There's 12 qualities of God's voice. Let's look at that for a moment. God's voice is a gentle voice. We see this in Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, and I'm going to read through these for you. If you have the sheet, please follow along. God's voice is a gentle voice. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, 
where art thou? God's voice is a quiet and deeply internal voice. 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 12 says, And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. God speaks in complement with principles of Scripture. God's voice is saturated with mercy and grace. John chapter 15, verse 15 says, Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. God's voice focuses on changing us as well, rather than changing others. Proverbs chapter 5 and verse 13 says, for the lips of a strange woman drop as in honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil. God's voice is grounded in truth and hope. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. God's voice is centered in the here and now. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 and 34 says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. God's voice is a counselor's voice, simple and practical. Mark chapter 9 and verse 7 says, Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. God's voice is not looking for a showy spectacle, just the ordinary, just the ordinary. Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. For my thoughts, pardon me, I think I, 8 and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts who have gone back, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Well, we see God's voice. We have to recognize when it's not God's voice. Scripture is clear that we should be able to recognize God's voice. When God speaks, you'll have more hope, not less hope. Knowing God's voice will produce more empathy for others as well. Jude chapter 22 and verse 22 says, and of some have compassion, making a difference. God's voice brings a sense of peace to the Christian. John chapter 10, verse 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. The purpose of of our devotions and Bible study is to enable us to discern the will of God by listening to the voice of God. Again, how do we communicate with God? Through study of the scripture. Remember 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10, 11? We started off, one of, that was one of our opening verses. To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. We are not ignorant of his devices. The world is ignorant of his devices. As a Christian, we are not to be ignorant of his devices because we have truth in our hands. We can study truth and we could gain the knowledge and wisdom of God and know how Satan operates. Satan's purpose is to bring an indictment by God's will. Satan and guilt. A man visits, let's just say, a men's church meeting on a Friday night. He's from the community. The leader greets him, meets with him because he's a first-time guest in order to share the gospel with him and introduce him to the discipleship program that they're holding. This man, being a Christian, and someone who prided himself on having a secular education, let's say, he 
thought himself worldly smart. Worldly smart. But he said he was a Christian. He was trying to encourage the group leader to use psychology in order to help the men that came to the meeting. Not necessarily so much scripture. Why use so much scripture when we've learned in the universities and in the world, you know, how psychology works. Can't that help other Christians? <laughs> After trying to show him the fallacies of an educational system that leaves out God, the Bible, and prayer, the secular humanism portion of what is taught in the school system, the leader finally said to him, look, we can't even agree as Christians with what psychology says about guilt. We do not blame our parents, our relatives, our friends, our neighbors, or our employees for the way our lives have turned out. The Bible indicates that all have sinned, and that means each one of us personally are responsible for our failures and our sins. Our guilt is not to be transformed to another person so that we might sleep better at night. No. Jesus Christ has paid our penalty for sin, and when we accept the blame for our sins, he graciously removes our guilt as well. Not only does Christ forgive us our sins, but he removes that guilt as well. Doesn't make us forget what we've done, certainly, but he removes the guilt so that we can have fellowship with him, with, with God. Well, that man walked out of the meeting. Sometimes that simple fact, that simple fact, is a stumbling block for even some Christians that trust in the world more than their Lord. Satan wants you to feel guilty. He wants you to experience regret and remorse, as I said earlier. Not inherently bad things to feel regret, because that brings us back to, to the Lord. Satan's goal is to keep accusing you so that you focus your attention on yourself, and your sins. We're not keeping our attention, as I say, vertically on God. We're keeping it horizontally on the world, on ourselves, and on our sins. Once you look to Jesus Christ, you will repent, confess your sins, and find cleansing and restoration and fellowship. As long as you're feeling guilty, you're under indictment, just like Joshua, sitting in that courtroom. Blaming others may give you temporary relief, but it will not last simply because we are made in the image of God. And part of that image is the need to be rid of our sins. Satan desires to move you further and further away from the Lord. We must learn to stop looking at ourselves and look to God. When we look at ourselves, Satan is winning the battle. When we look to God, Simply, Satan is losing that battle. God and guilt. Let's talk about that just for a moment. While Satan wants us to feel guilty, God wants us to know that we are forgiven. The devil knows that if you are living under a cloud of despair, doubt, and guilt, then you're not going to be an effective witness. You're not going to be of good service for the Lord will be lacking. We need God's blessing and power as we seek to walk in the Spirit. There are some churches that seem to major in casting guilt on people. Bible Baptist Church of Holden Beach needs to be the kind of church that lifts up the fallen and helps the wounded to get back on their feet so that they might soldier on. That doesn't mean that our pastor should not paint a clear picture of sin in our lives for us to recognize when we may be a bit slow to deal with that sin in our life. That's what our pastor is to do as our pastor. Local churches are not to major on beating down Christians. That's the church body, the congregants. We're not to be beating down on the other congregants. We can have a discussion. We certainly can. We, we read it today's reading was perfectly appropriate for this part of the lesson. Local churches are to major on hope, forgiveness, restoration. Restoration is the key here. 
There's a place for proper spiritual conviction, but we must not take on the Holy Spirit's work as our own work by majoring on guilt. The Holy Spirit certainly convicts me at times. When I start to head down the wrong path, being saved, the Holy Spirit directs me back to God. Here's your defense, as we said earlier. The interceding Son of God, our advocate, Jesus Christ. We read in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Knowing and being in a courtroom setting, that just, uh, you know, for many years, that just, that is just, I love that verse. I just love that verse. I've got an advocate. I've got my own, in, in a, from a worldly perspective, I have my own, my own attorney. I have someone looking out for my best interests. I can keep my mouth shut, and Jesus Christ will defend me. When Satan stands at our right hand, as he did with Joshua, accusing us, Jesus Christ stands at God's right hand to intercede for us. Who needs an advocate? The innocent? Do the innocent need an advocate? Yes, the innocent need an advocate. But you really, you really, again, I'm going to go back to my old life in law enforcement, the person that really needs an advocate is the guilty. The person that is accused justly, they've done wrong. That's me. I've done wrong. I was guilty. I needed an advocate. I needed someone to stand up for me before a holy God, our Father, and plead my case. And how he pleaded my case was shedding his blood for my sins and my guilt. Mm. When Jesus finished his work on earth and returned to heaven, was his work completed? He's still, still interceding for you and me. The gospel was completed when Jesus rose from the grave. His redemptive work was completed. But there is more to the Lord's work than providing salvation for us on the cross. There is the present work of perfecting his children and preparing us for glory. Note in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20 and 21 says, Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. The perfecting ministry has two aspects. Two aspects. As our high priest, Jesus Christ intercedes for us and provides the grace that we need when we are tested and tempted. If we turn to him by faith and call upon him, he will see us through the victory. Through to victory, I should say. As our advocate, so he's our high priest, but as our advocate, Jesus Christ stands ready to forgive us and restore us to fellowship once again. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Picture the courtroom scene again with me, where Joshua is sitting in Zechariah 3. We read that earlier. God is the judge. He's sitting on the throne. Joshua, the high priest, stands before God. He's dressed in those filthy robes we talked about. He's guilty. He's guilty. Satan stands next to Joshua to resist him and accuse him. But Jesus is at God's right hand to represent Joshua and to restore him. 
Note again, we saw this earlier in uh, 1 John 1, 9, that Jesus is described as what? Faithful and just. He's just. There is no bending of the rules to accommodate for sin. That would be a disgrace to which is just. He's faithful to keep his promise to receive us and forgive us. This is why we sing so much about the precious blood of Jesus right here in in church. It's still doing its work, not only redeeming sinners, but restoring sinning saints, those that are saved, those that are saved, to places of usefulness, making us a vessel fit for the master's use. We can still, even though we go down a poor path at times, we can plead the blood of Jesus, reconcile with God, ask for forgiveness, and come back into fellowship with God, and then become useful vessels once again. 2 Timothy 2, verse 21 says, If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. As sinners, we are saved from the wrath of God by God's mercy and grace. As children of God, we are forgiven by God's faithfulness and justice. God never closes his eyes to the reality of our sins. God will never defend sin, not even the sin of his children but he will defend his children. Abraham disobeyed and went down to Egypt and lied about Sarah being his wife. God did not defend Abraham's sin, but he did defend Abraham. He kept the ruler from taking Sarah to himself and defiling her. He also helped Abraham get out of the land safely. Did Abraham suffer any consequences for his sin? Oh, yes. Egypt gave Lot a taste of the world, and this ultimately led to Lot's backsliding and downfall. The Egyptian maid, Hagar, brought into the family another set of problems. Ultimately, she had to be cast out, but God was never out of control of the situation. He was faithful and just to Abraham and Sarah. When you listen to Satan's accusations, you focus your attention on yourself and on your sins. Expect defeat and discouragement every time when you go down that path. When you listen to the Holy Spirit's conviction, that's contrary to what the devil is putting in your mind or trying to tell you. You will look by faith to Jesus Christ in heaven, your advocate. You will remember remember that he died for you and that God has promised to accept you, not to reject you. This heavenly intercession by the Son of God is how you can defeat your enemy, the devil. Quickly, three stages in Joshua's experience. Stage one is Satan's resistance. Satan names Joshua's sins at the throne of God and calls upon God's holiness to judge Joshua. Stage two is God's rebuke. This rebuke is grace-based, not human merit-based. Jesus went through the fires of judgment that he might pluck us from the burning. I'll read that verse. Verse 2, And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan, even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Our relationship with God is not based on what we have done. It's not works-based. Our relationship with God is not based on the law. Our relationship with God is based on his grace, God's grace. Grace means acceptance with God and Jesus Christ. Stage three, Joshua's restoration. God orders them to remove the filthy clothes and put holy garments upon the high priest. He even put that holy turban on his head, the one that read holiness to the Lord. You can see that in Exodus chapter 28. There is not even a probation period here. Joshua is told to get back to serving the Lord. Immediately. Restoration is immediate. There's no need to be discouraged and defeated. There really isn't. All you have to do is confess your sins and turn by faith 
to our advocate, Jesus Christ. When a person gets into trouble with the law, they hire an attorney, as we talked about, an advocate. The attorney will tell the accused, in order for me to mount a defense, in order for me, as your advocate, to mount a defense, I must know everything. I can tell you that's the first thing a defense attorney will say to a person that's been accused. I, as your advocate, need to know everything. Contrast that with Jesus Christ, our Lord. Confess all to God. Don't leave anything out. Confess all to God, and he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Trust God's word. Trust God's word, not your feelings. Charles Wesley put this thought into a beautiful hymn, and I'll just read because I do not sing. I will read you this hymn. Depth of mercy, can there be mercy still reserved for me? Can my God his wrath forbear me, the chief of sinners, spare? I have long withstood his grace, long provoked him to his face, would not hearken to his calls, grieved him by a thousand falls. Lord, incline me to repent. Let me now my sins lament. Now my foul revolt deplore. Weep, believe, and sin no more. Still for me the Savior stands, holding forth his wounded hands. God is love, I know, I feel. Jesus weeps and loves me still. Those are great words. It's a great hymn. If any of you know the hymn, you certainly didn't get the idea of the music part of it from me. But I love the words of that hymn. I'll close with a quick story, as usual. Two pastors' wives were visiting each other and sewing their husbands' past, pants. Two pastors' wives. One wife says to the other wife, my husband is just beside himself. He doesn't know what to do anymore, and he is so tired and depressed, he said he's ready to give it all up and resign from the church. The other wife said, I'm sorry to hear that because my husband has never been happier. Our membership's growing. We're out of our financial burden. We've had such a large and loving congregation. Life could not be any better than it is right now. To God be the glory. One woman was mending the seat of her husband's pants. The other woman was mending the knees. Which one was which, do you think? Brother Dellis, would you close us out in prayer, please? Amen.
Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, 